And look, in the traditions of my theatre, even if you've got to leave early, there has to be trouble right down the front. And I cannot use this microphone because I hate using it. So could you go to the very kind? Please don't worry. If you've got to leave early, you've got to sneak out. That's, 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 that's also the tradition of my theatre. Come and go when you want to. multiracial society, I presume, in the world, and certainly one of the fast-changing multiracial societies in the world, uh, you must be wondering why a middle-aged English wasp has come here to talk about multiculturalism. And that did give, did give me second thoughts when I realised, arriving here, what it was I was doing. And especially for somebody, and forgive me, I will be personal at the beginning of this talk, because I think it's it's important as to how our theatre developed to win that award in that rather embarrassingly overpraising citation. Um, because I was educated as a racist, like by far the majority of English people who are now middle-aged were educated to be. I went to primary, when I went to primary school, I was shown the globe of the world, I can remember it. I was shown how a quarter of it was painted red which meant how superior we were because we conquered in one way or another a quarter of the world. I didn't see any, any Afro, any black people, Afro-Asian people at all as a child. I think I remember vaguely seeing a black soldier during the war in a large department store briefly right across at the other side of the department store and being amazed. Otherwise, I didn't see black people even and I knew my total education was to do with the superiority of the English, and of course I was never taught how we conquered those territories. I was never taught some of the, of the appalling things that we did in, those, those, in our colonies, and I certainly wasn't taught that the whole base of English wealth was in our exploitation of those colonies. In particular, for example, West, in, in the West Indies, the, the sugar plantations was a particularly strong part of English wealth, and our, and our partaking in slave labour was part of English law. So I wasn't taught all those things. I did go to the pictures on Saturday mornings and I saw Tarzan films. And I saw and black people as far as I was concerned, they leapt up and down in funny clothes, were usually stupid, often wicked apparently. Just occasionally they were a faithful servant. They were funny sometimes. But they weren't much else. And so I was brought up with not by particularly racist parents, but by a totally racist education system. And I have no reason to believe anything else. I won't go on about that, because I suspect that in, the, in my middle years, I've, I've, I've probably repressed and forgotten the times that I was patronizing to black people. I have repressed them. I went through all those stages until later, until later in my life, when I was much more fortunate and worked with many, many black people who are now very close colleagues of mine. And I, as I say, I dread to think of the patronizing stages I went to in between on that journey. And I do not either maintain that I'm not now racist in some people one's always got vestiges, and just occasionally one catches oneself out with at least compartmentalized thinking. I can remember only three or four years ago when I'd done a production at, at my own theatre of um, a show about Josephine Baker, with nine very talented black artists in it. As a director, I was thinking of my next production and casting it. And there was a particular part in my next production that I was concerned about. And the next production was The Ticket of Leave Man, which was a an English melodrama 
with the first detective ever on stage in it. And at the back of my mind was I had not yet cast this important part that needed some charisma and drive and vitality, and I haven't found the right person yet. I'm watching my own production of <coughs> Joseph, the Josephine Baker story with nine black artists in it, and I saw someone come on, I directed it, playing a Southern Baptist minister with great fire and charisma and all the rest of it, and I thought, that's the kind of person I want. And I realised to my shame I hadn't thought of casting somebody black in the part I was, that I was then casting. And that's an example of compartmentalisation, which stays with white administrators, white directors, etc., very often all their lives. Um, but the journey, the, the journey to Peter or Stratford East, anyway, being perhaps a bit less personal. Can you hear me for that, by the way? Can you hear me? Yes, you're all right. Thank you. Um, and it wasn't Theodore Roystrapanese's compar comparative success these days with a very mixed audience in every sense, the citation says, in class, in age, in race, etc. It didn't come because of some master plan or some big change of heart on my part or some revelation. It came from the roots of that theatre. Um, and it, I'll just tell you a couple of brief stories there which I think are important for which, which illustrate why it has developed in the way, in, way, in the way it has. I first went there, and by the way, the Theatre Royal Stratford East is in the poorest part of, of Britain. Uh, it's in the east end of London, where the Cockneys come from, the real east enders, yes, they're called Cockneys. Um, it's the poorest part of Britain. It's always been working class. It's the docks. It's the big, the big London docks, which used to be one of the biggest in the world by far. Uh, it was also always an area of immigration because the docks were there. That was where immigrants first got the ships. That's very often where they stayed. It was also, therefore, there were many, many there were waves of immigration, Jewish immigration in particular, earlier this century. Uh, it was a big Jewish local population. Uh, later, um, Afro-Caribbean, particularly West Indian, after the, the second, after the Second World War. And in the last 20 years or so, a very heavy influx of Pakistani and Indian people in that area. It's a very, very mixed race area, but it's always been a working class area. And when I first knew it, it wasn't, it wasn't very heavily Afro-Caribbean because the, the, the way of immigrants hadn't really arrived there as yet. And I went to visit it, and it was run by a woman called Joan Littlewood, who is the most, one of the two or three most famous British directors since the war. And she was until, I think, last year, until, until I think, The Secret Garden, the only woman to even be nominated for a Tony Award for winning a before directing a musical, for example. She's a very exceptional director, revolutionary director, absolutely a law unto herself, owed nothing to anybody, uh, brilliantly self-educated, particularly foul-mouthed at times, um, and uh, a very tough woman indeed, and who many people are extremely fond of. But she, she created something of a revolution in British theatre after the war, along with the Royal Court Theatre, but ours was the more determinedly, determinedly working class end of that revolution, in that British theatre had become very middle class, Noel Coward plays, a, a typical example, uh, French window plays, as they're called, they always have French windows in them, <laughs> and uh, usually somebody leaping through them saying, anyone for tennis, was the kind of plays that we put on, or, uh, this, this century to a, group, to a very large extent the theatre was taken over by the middle classes. It was, it was Joan and another theatre in the, in the west of London, which in a way gave the theatre back to the middle classes, to the working class, to some extent, to some extent. And in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, she did a series of shows there. It's a Victorian theatre man, the, the, the Stratford East, by the way, 100 odd years old. And it's, she did a series of shows there, some of which went well, around the world, A Taste of Honey, Oh, what a lovely war, the hostage. We went to Broadway, we went to many other countries. And she brought, uh, brought onto the stage also, there was a vogue in the English theatre for many, many years that the leading men and women were handsome, terribly well spoken, upper class people. Working class people were servants, usually comic. The same stereotypes that black people achieved later. We put working class people into those stereotypes. I mean, I mean that black people achieved in, or were put into, in. Hollywood films and plays and so on. But work, the working class in England until the late 50s were in that category. 
And among the actors, and, and there was a time when, with Joan, their actors could be fat or ugly, or they could be, they could be all different shapes and sizes suddenly. Actors that came through our theatre, then Richard Harris started there, uh, Michael Caine started there, and many names that you won't know, which became famous in England, through television and theatre, which didn't necessarily travel, uh, travel beyond, to, their names didn't necessarily travel beyond Britain. I first went there in the, in the 1960 to see a show, which was a, a play by Ben Johnson. I studied Ben Johnson at university, and in my arrogance I knew that Ben Johnson, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, I knew he was difficult and very boring, I thought. I felt a terrible time you know, at struggling through Ben Johnson's works. When I went there to see this 400-year-old play, what was extraordinary, and which was typical of Joan's work, was that I, I arrived an hour early for some reason, so I was in the bar, and, and then the coffee bar, and so we have a bar in our theatre, a very lively one, and listening to people talking, listening to the people behind the bar talking and so on. And since I'd been away from the country for some time, the Cockney accent was just new to my ears again, apart from in films. So it was very much in my head. The music was very, uh, the, the rhythm was very much in my head. And when I went inside and saw Ben Johnson's play, Every Man in His Humour, what I couldn't get over was, from the work, I was absolutely, as we say, gobsmacked. I don't know what you say. <laughs> uh, but completely uh, astonished. I could not get over it. When I went inside, the language coming from the stage was exactly the same as what was happening in the bar and in the street. But Ben Johnson, 400 years old, she had a brilliance for making it sound immediate, every day, and even though some of the words I couldn't understand, I absolutely understood the sense of what was going on. And that was part of Joan's extraordinary genius, to make work accessible, however classic it was. And then one other experience I mentioned from that time was that I, they started a drama school, which I joined, and then in the evenings to, be, to pay to go to drama school, I'd go and teach what I was learning during the day. A very good experience, and I recommend to you to go and teach what... Teachers learn, I think, more than students ever do when they, when they, when they usually. And uh, that teaching, what I was learning on the day, I learned a great deal more that way around by repeating it at night. And I, I, I taught for a while, though, at, um, in a local technical college, a very tough class indeed. Made Blackpool, Blackpool Jungle look like a kindergarten, actually. They were a very tough class indeed of young engineering apprentices who didn't have to get any, any uh, pass any examination or anything. They just had to be there for two hours a week. That was all. To attend an English class, which they had absolutely no interest in attending. They were covered in leather and grease in their hair at that time. We were, they were so tough that we were put outside in the, the new building. We were put outside in the converted bicycle sheds because they were, they were, it was almost certainly destroyed wherever they were. Uh, and uh, the bicycle children were in the sunken part of the play playground. So they'd roar around the playground in their motorbikes, climb up their motorbikes, through the windows of the classroom, across the desks, and then sit down. And I was in there talking 16 to the dozen, trying to, uh, just terrified to death, but trying not to look so. Anyway, the only way I could get them to write any English, to write anything down, was to get them to write dirty jokes. <laughs> so for six weeks, they wrote absolutely filthy jokes down as they had their work, trying harder and harder to shock me. And then when they'd return next week, I'd have on the blackboard all the four-letter words correctly spelled and so on. <laughs> Hand them back their dirty jokes, marked for imagination and spelling and so on. And we went on like this with this battle. Uh, and I must own up, I swore back at them, they swore at me. Every, every teaching rule went out the window. It was, it was, uh, it was a battle. Then I decided to take them to the Theatre Royal Stratford East one week. And hard, the, uh, the first lesson was we, only, we were only a mile and a half from the Theatre Royal Stratford East. It was their local theatre. It was world famous at that time. Only three in the class of 30 had heard of that theatre. That was the first lesson. My second was I arranged to meet them there, and I was late, 10 minutes late. I arranged it for half past seven. I dashed into the box office, looked through the foyer, looked through the bar, couldn't find one. Went out the front, looked again, searched the building again, back out the front, still couldn't find them. Then I saw them. They'd been there all the time. I'd walked past them twice. They were standing in a frightened puddle at the front of the theatre in suits, white shirts, ties, hair parted, 
I did not recognize them at all. And they were terrified of going for a bit. And that's been a lesson to me for the rest of my life, that, that how frightening it can be for people who haven't been to the theatre going for the first time. To continue the story, um, in the involvement of, of, a, of a policy at Stratford East, the only other I think, personal element I put in there is I, I went, when I began to run theatres of my own later in the regions of England, um, I, when I started, there were no such things as press officers and marketing officers. You were, you're light years ahead in, t in those terms than we are. But in the, 60, the early 60s, we didn't have press officers in regional theatres. They arrived in the late 60s. And we didn't, marketing officers were completely on their own. And I'm very glad that I came from a time when there weren't press officers and marketing officers. Not because I'm against press and marketing officers at all. I'm extremely interested in that side. Um, but because at that time, when we didn't have them, it was everybody in the theatre's job to sell the show. Everybody. The carpenter, the actor, the director, everybody knew it was their job to talk about the show, wherever you went, etc. If the new actor arrives in town, he gets a bus or a taxi, he tells the taxi driver or the bus conductor what the show is about, why he's in town, where he's going. And that communal attitude to making the art accessible is something that I deeply regret is gone, because for all now, press and marketing officers are totally essential, and marketing in particular has developed hugely as an important science of those. Nevertheless, I regret that once they've been appointed, the rest of the building thinks, oh, that's their job. They get people in, that's their job. We don't have anything to do with that. It should not be the case. It should remain a communal activity. And indeed, at Theatre Royal now, we have a weekly meeting to do with press and marketing, which the director attends, the associate director, the education officer, the house manager, the marketing officer, the press officer, etc. They're all there. It's all our job to think of ideas. The, when, the, when the actors appoint an equity deputy, a deputy for their union, they also appoint a press, a press and marketing actor to be responsible for getting ideas through from the actors to the press and marketing officer. It remains communal activity. Just occasionally I have in my life met press and marketing officers who are resentful of this because they think it's their territory and they should have all the ideas. I think that's also wrong as well. It's everybody's responsibility. And that is, I think, part of what's happened at my own theatre is that. It isn't a separate thing. Anyway, leaping on slightly, when I, be I became Joan Little's assistant later, and there's one story about her I'll tell which summarizes the, an attitude in the building which I think has been important in developing what is now labeled a multicultural policy. I slightly regret that it is, but it's just part of the inheritance of the place, really. In 1972, when I was assistant to Joe in the production, they say, then she would go famous. All the national critics would be there to the first night of the play. It was a first night. This <coughs> After the New York Times the critic was there. World's press would come to our little theater in East End because Joan was, was so famous for producing hit shows occasionally. <coughs> seven, the show started at 8 o'clock. Seven, at 7.30, I think it was almost as late as that, perhaps, perhaps it was an hour before, I went in the foyer to the box office, and Joan was on her hands and knees <coughs> at the front door with a scrubbing brush and a bucket of water and soap and scrubbing the front step of the theatre. An actor returning from the pub or wherever he'd been for the first night stepped over her and said, what are you doing, Joan? She looked at him, up at him violently and said, I'm expecting company, aren't you? <laughs> the front step wasn't clean, but she went, she cleaned it. Because we were expecting company, and that was the attitude of the whole building. <coughs> there was a gap between Joan and I, actually, and I remember when I went back, I was, I was, I saw a notice over the front, over the, over the box office, and I, which I couldn't believe was happening in Jones Theatre with, with its uh, awareness of accessibility. And above the box office it said, uh, Brett's, uh, what's it, Puntilla and, and his hired servant Matthew, <coughs> the first production since the Royal Shakespeare, the first major production since the Royal Shakespeare production in 1957, or something like that. That had nothing at all to do with it the people in our district. I mean, the fact that it was the first production since 19... That was a statement to other theatrical people. That would be a barrier to anybody who 
wanted to go to the theatre for the first time, that, that they're supposed to know or care. This is the first major production since 1967 or whenever it was of a particular play. And that upset me so much. When I discovered how far it had slipped from Jones' days, the result, when I suggested something, I forget what it was, some idea to the market, to the press officer. And she said, but if we do that, anybody might come. Which was the exact opposite of what Jones' theatre was about. She expressed ability to be a communist as well, which really took a bit surprise when she had the attitude that anybody might send the theatre and this is a terrible thing to happen. And I was so shocked by this that I didn't have this I don't, know, I don't know if you call them the same. The sandwich boards, do you call them? We know, with the board, the board on the front and the back and the front at the top. I had one made for me as director of the theatre, and for three months, I used to go round that, round where that, round the shopping precinct locally. Uh, do you call them shopping precincts? Yes? No? The, the shopping mall, the local one, round the corner. I used to go around wearing that for three months, every Saturday, all day, which mortified many of the staff in the theatre. <laughs> But I was so determined to show that we had to do everything possible, always, to communicate with people and get them in. Now, the progress in the... Oh, I've told all those stories really to illustrate that Joan's policy of being close to her local community and of being accessible to her local community, and she'd been doing that for 40-odd years, and it extended it artistically in that in the, there was a sort of what she called a continuous loop between the audience and the stage. You drew from the local audience, you tried to get plays written by the local audience if possible, and sometimes she succeeded. You certainly dealt with local themes, you certainly listened to your local audience. One time she took it to an extreme, I remember, in a play. It didn't work this terribly well, but it was, it was a brilliant attempt. Just outside our theatre, there was a street market, vegetable stalls and so on. And some of those women on the street market had wonderful back chat, wonderful talk, very funny, very witty indeed. And in one play she put on, which was a local play, she put on either side of the stage two of these women with their carts, with selling their fruit. They were on either side of the stage. The actors would continue with the play, which is sort of rather domestic local play in the centre. And these two women would talk about it, just comment on them, on what was going on with the actors and the audience. Some nights it worked absolutely brilliantly, and sometimes it was terrible. <laughs> They'd actually sometimes comment upon the acting as well. You know, she's, she's going it tonight, isn't she? And say, talk about the actors and talk back to the audience. And say, when they were in good form, these two women, it was a brilliant evening. Some nights they didn't want to talk at all, so the play was much shorter. <laughs> That's a very extreme example. Joan would go to extremes try and discover how far she could, she could go in sheer liveliness and immediacy in her work. And as I say, she had this, what she called, continuous loop, where, whereby she would try and draw from and reflect back to the local community. So it was a continuing give and take with your local community. And because it was a very rich in character, very poor in money, but very rich in character, companies are quite famous for their rich. Uh, it was very productive at times, this, this piece. And indeed, when I took those young men to see it, what absolutely astonished them, they did relax finally, by the way, they had a few drinks, when they discovered there was a bar in the theatre and they'd buy drinks like you could elsewhere, that began them getting used to it, and then they enjoyed the show, and it was a cockney show, and they just kept saying to me afterwards, they couldn't believe it, that their mum and dad were on the stage, that it was their own language, it was their own attitude and so on, that were actually on the stage, they couldn't believe that. The last thing they expected, they knew, like most people in the district, that theatre was a snob and elite thing, elite event, and not for them. Not for them, that terrible thing that's happened to theatre. Anyway, in the, in the 80s, when I did take over, and I've been there 12 years now, by then we had a very, a very the, the afro Caribbean locally, it's 40% um, Afro-Asian. And when we say Asian in English, it's one of those things we usually mean Pakistani and Indian because that is by far the majority of Asian people. We talk about Chinese people, Japanese people, and Asian people. And by Asian, we usually mean, uh, as I say, Pakistani and Indian. And it was 40% Afro-Asian by the time I took over. And so it was, but it wasn't a few, it was just part of the natural process that had been going on for 40 years. The loop between your audience and the stage, what went on the stage, what was given back to the audience, 
was exactly, was exactly just changed because of the, of the larger Afro-Asian population. But it's the, but it's the same philosophy continued. Uh, there was no decision to be multicultural or to argue whether one's pluralistic or whatever. All those arguments just never took place in that theatre. We just went on doing the same job, and, was, and, and naturally uh, that process happened. And we, we sought out, of course, Afro-Asian writers. Uh, uh, mixed casting is automatic um, in our plays, uh, apart from when the director backslides and forget and discovers a compartment in his own mind in the example that I gave you. And indeed, it's now got to a stage where, where because there is a, which I will answer questions at the end of this, and, but I don't want to go into the English system of, of funding theatre too much, but, this, it, it, but it does account for the comparative freedom that I have got, in that I can trust to write as much more. I can actually announce plays that haven't been written fairly easily. I know the writer's a good one, has a good idea. I can announce the play, and then he writes the play, he or she writes the play uh, during the next six months. I've got much greater freedom, and consequently, you can get much more immediate work that suits your local area. And I think that I have trouble talking about multiculturalism because to me, it's the same. It, 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 it's, it's just the same as me fighting to get in a working class audience in our, in our district. The English are much more class conscious. There's much more sharp divisions between class in England than there are here. We talk about it a great deal more. And there, is, there are real divisions. And the attempts to continually break the barriers, the snob barriers, so that people feel that theatre is for them, are uh, what we concentrate on. We don't necessarily think Afro-Asian, we, we don't necessarily think in race at all in those terms. We just think about getting people in who don't normally go to the theatre. Which in our district, with the new part of the district, involves Afro-Asian people automatically. And so it means that we take great deal. We make sure there's product on the stage they're interested in. There are people on stage today that, that all classes and races identify with. We, make sh we try very hard to, we don't always succeed in our publicity material to make it accessible. I think a great deal of theatre publicity I see in England anyway, I can't speak for America, is elitist in its <coughs> own nature. It's talking automatically to people who already go to the theatre. And therefore it's building barriers against those who don't already go to the theatre. Um, when I see things in England like, uh, I am seeing an advertisement for... Um, Ghosts by I Ibsen, and it began an open sewer, a running sore. This is what the critic William so and so said about this play in the Daily Telegraph in 1888 or whenever it was. But this play is really about so and so. I mean, who wants to, <laughs> who wants to go and see the open sewer and the running sewer? Um, even though they're showing off their knowledge about what the, what's about the play originally. It's great that showing off of knowledge goes into advertising, I think showing up to other people, or to people who already go to the theatre. And breaking those barriers is very important. Also, I think, well, the Americans are, again, light years ahead in customer care and all those kinds of activities compared to British people. But there's one thing that we do every year. At the beginning of every season, we have an improvisation session with the ushers and the house manager and the box office staff and everybody, and usually several actors join in, well, always several actors join in. And we run an improvisation session where, where the actors play people who are coming to the theatre for the first time. And then they do what's called a stream of consciousness, which means they talk under their breath what they are thinking as they go through this whole process as the new customer. And I get the staff to behave in various ways, rudely and politely and so on, and to realise how frightened, well, to them, my staff is very young, front of house, is older people probably are in going for the first time to the theatre. If they dared to book, if they dared to get past the box office, and they arrive and they pick up a ticket. I went to theatre in New York just before I was here with a young man who'd never been to a, to a play before. He'd been to a musical once never been to a play before, and I'd given him, he had the tickets. When he came in the front door, I noticed he went straight to the box office with the tickets. And
carrying the ticket woman. She wasn't being very rude, but she said something, something about, you know, I, no, I, I sell them, I don't take them, or something like that. Something quite cutting, but it put him off terribly. He felt embarrassed, felt ashamed, he hadn't known what to do, etc. And it can be a very frightening experience. I've got the tickets, but what does it mean, dress circle or box or what does it mean? Where do I go with this ticket? Do I sit, is it, what's the number of it? Is it like a pop concert? Do I sit where I like? Where all the things going through their heads on this social occasion where they can be made ashamed and possibly in front of friends made ashamed. But to, so, and so we do these improvisation sessions to make certain. And I'm thinking there, just of uh, anybody who's not been to the theatre before, I'm thinking of. Prices enormously important. That's another barrier, apart from the psychological barrier, of course. And I'm very proud to say with our place that 30% of the people who come to our theatre get in for $3, £2, roughly $3, I think, isn't it? I think, yes, about. Um, so anybody unemployed, any student, anybody working for a hospital, because hospitals pay notoriously badly in England, um, anybody, uh, it's certain, it's, it sounds peculiar, but certain illnesses, but you, you can't tell from the card, the card they give in that they have any sort of illness. It's just a sort of concession card. Anybody can get it who's, who's, who's uh, uh, old age pensioners, etc. And so 30% of the audience now comes in for uh, the equivalent of about $3, $3 something, I think. And they can book ahead for that. One of the only things I disagree with Joe Pack, who died recently with, I agree to so much of what he did, one of the only things I disagree with him was that sort of the queue in the foyer for returns, the student queue, or whatever queue it was, who may be able to get in cheap if. That I don't agree. I don't agree with poor queues. Either you've got, to, you've got to treat people, you've got to treat people like human beings properly, and they can book ahead for their three pounds. Like if you ring that book six weeks ahead, they can get the best seats on a Saturday night for three pounds, which is something that we've fought for and kept for years. And it hasn't gone up uh, two pounds. I mean, it hasn't gone up for about five years. That and we're determined we're keeping it down, and more and more people are coming. And indeed, again, because of the English system of financing theatres, we spend far more advertising our £2 tickets than our £12 tickets. Now that's because, it sounds like a, a, a stupid thing to do financially, it is in a way, but there is a sense to it as well. The, the actual illiterate people, I mean, people who have gone to the theatre an awful lot, they find out what's on at our theatre fairly easily. They know which pages to read, they know which columns to look in all that. They find out, if they're interested, they'll travel to it and come and pay their travel plans. And there are people who ring up and say, what's the top price? And they're going to pay that whatever it is. And so £12 is our top price for them. But getting it through to people who have not been to this before, and so we, we've done big posters this year, biggish posters this year, just advertising the fact you can get a good night out for £2. And that goes around doctor's surgeries, unemployment centres, youth centres, community centres, and we send people around to sell, to get people into the idea that for two pounds they can have a good night out. Cheaper than the cinema. That idea. And it's begun to, it has begun to work. Yeah. Needless to say, it's starts being through the theatre. Uh, it, is, it is multicultural in every sense. The board is, is uh, completely mixed. Well, more women than men, I'm glad to say, on the board. Far more, it's two thirds women. And so it should be in the theatre because more women go to the theatre than men anyway. Um, it's one third Afro Asian, I think, I think my board at the moment. That's extremely important, but uh, of course, for very obvious reasons. And those are battles that are fought very often in this country. Um, how, do I, how do I get away with this? How, how, why is this possible? Cheap prices, we do new work all the time. Um, eight productions a year, eight full-scale productions a year. Well, it's because the board are very liberal-minded. They absolutely back me. Uh, back the policy, I should say. It just happened to have been 12 years conducting it. Um, it's because the local, local borough, we get, in England, nearly two-thirds of the money that supports our data comes from government sources in one source or another. One-third local in the local borough which is the second poorest borough in the country, but it still gives our theatre 220,000 pounds a year, dollars, over 300,000 dollars a year. Um, 
and then from central government we get the equivalent amount of that. And we get no interference. We get it for our policy of new work and low prices, etc. Which means I've got to do a lot less work raising money. We're not going to work ahead. We have to do a lot less work raising money and don't have to have development offices and don't have to spend time, thought, imagination, etc. in searching for sponsorships. It's not a tradition in England. Only 6% of the money that goes to the arts in England comes from corporate bodies and sponsorship and all those activities. We are, we, we are way behind with you. We don't have the tradition and normally they don't give it anyway because there's, there isn't a tradition of giving in that sense in England. We are much more accustomed to relying on the state and expecting the state, just as the state gives free medicine and the state is, is, should be, the state in one form or another, central or local, should be concerned about libraries, about swimming pools, um, about social facilities, etc. We believe the arts are part of that and they should, be, they should give the money for our money. They should give us our money from taxes back to us for those purposes, we believe. Um, and so the, the rich rewards of multicultural diversity, is that, was that the term about the title, correct? <laughs> the rich rewards, what are the rich rewards? Well, apart from the obvious social rich rewards, uh, what others can I Critical, financial, aesthetic? Not always critical rewards do we get. We do some, we do, not particularly anti the critics, but they often don't understand the context in which we're doing plays. I mean by that is that by being eternally local, playing to essentially a working class audience, most critics do not come from, well, if they were whatever working class ones, they're, much, they're usually middle class or with middle class values or whatever, and they sometimes do completely mistake the intention of our plays and what our plays are meant for. Um, let me give an example of that. We did a play by a new young author, his first play ever, 24 year old uh, Indian young man, I think he was born in England, but he was an Indian young man who lived in a, in a, in a district of London on the other side of London, which had a lot of racial violence indeed in it, against Asians. And he wrote a play about racial, street racial violence, and about discussions in the Indian young people, if they should get together and form vigilante posses and fight back, or what they should do about the violence in the streets. Um, on the first night of that play, I was talking in the bar to a young Carib ex-Caribbean, youngish ex-Caribbean man and his Indian friend. And it was the first time the Indian friend had ever been to a theatre in about 30. And he said a sentence which is absolute music to any director's ears, which was, he'd never been before, how much he'd enjoyed it, and again, that same phrase, how surprised he was to hear a totally uh, uncensored, un, uh, unaffected in it, with pu totally pure voice of Asian youth on the stage, um, saying that it was an Asian author and an Asian cast and so on, and saying what they wanted to say. That was very pleasing. They then left the building, and I heard the next day they'd been attacked in the street by four young white thugs who attacked them fairly severely. They then went to the police station, and when, by the time they got to the police station and they walked there, the police had already caught the four young men, had already got the four young men there, not for attacking these two, but for some damage to property they'd done earlier in the evening. And the police refused to charge these four thugs with attacking this couple, these, these other two men. Now, that was either purely a racist thing, and that's how you like it, or it was they couldn't be bothered because they'd already got them already on a property charge, and it was a great deal more trouble to them because they had to have a, they'd have to have a line-up and a lot more fuss and bother to get them on the other charge. Either way, it was certainly racist, One, either because they couldn't be bothered or whatever way around. And, and, indeed, and, and these two young men were actually standing there saying, but that's my blood on his jacket. They did this to us. We took the case up as much as we could, as far as possible we could, we went to Parliament and so on. We got next to nowhere with it, a reprimand of some kind happened. But the next morning, having had that incident, and in the play, four young white thugs attacked an Asian boy in the plains, and then in the streets afterwards, 
because there's usually there's a racial attack about once every hour in our district uh, that's of any description. It doesn't begin to match what happens in Chicago or New York or anything, but it nevertheless is very much there. The percentage is much lower than in, in your urban centres. But the Guardian critic in the posh paper said about our play, why does this young man have to write about racial violence in the street? Don't we know about all that? Why can't he write about more, more, more subtle racism? This is about a young man. His first play he comes from a racially violent district, and he writes about that. We get that kind of complete that attitude, where they, where, and very often our actors are told, we may have an old black play on with a black family, is, and then the, the, the white liberal critic chooses to tell our actors that black people don't behave like that. <laughs> they don't speak like that. That wouldn't happen in black culture, etc. You get that kind of thing. But in general, I've not got many complaints about the critics. That's one of the dangers of it. Financial rewards, yes, we've had remarkable financial rewards. Not in the way we've been aiming for, actually. But there's, there's an irony in the fact that uh, it's a, a show that we, just, that we did last year, which was, interestingly, written by a black American, directed by a black American, choreographed by another black American, the musical director was a black American, half the cast of six were black Americans. It was developed in our district, it's gone to New York, it's gone to, it's been in the West End of London, it's transferred, and it goes, it opens on Broadway in April next year. That developed in another country with a group of black American artists, uh, and that's going to Broadway, I said, this year. We, we, we're getting into a new vein, which I'm very, very pleased about where with the cost of immigration to our country of Afro-Caribbean people, Asian people, was very much later, very much later. In fact, the population of, the Afro-Asian population of Britain is about, is just a minute, 4.8% Afro-Asian. But in some areas, of course, in inner city areas, it's very, very much higher. As I've said in ours, where it's 40%. But, but there's, there's, and their history is, in some, it's very different in our country from yours, and the history of their struggles is much more recent than yours. And the breakthrough of talent has been happening in the past 15 or so years, very noticeably. And it's becoming a great strength to our theatre that I can now um, hand my theatre over at times to a, to a, a frequently do co production with black companies, or we just hand it over to show if somebody has an idea which we think is going to, in some way, when I say work, I mean connect with our audience. And just occasionally that produces financial benefits. Indeed, the show we have on at the moment is now planned for Broadway next year as well. We're running through a ridiculous amount of luck at the moment, which is not, this, I never think, of, we never think about financial transfers, but that is happening to us at the moment. I think lastly and most important in terms of rich rewards, is to do with the actual art, is to do with any art, and most particularly performance arts. And that is to do with... When, if you choose to go to... If you choose to leave your television set and go out for a night and join a large group of people watching something, watching a play, you've unconsciously chosen to be part of a larger group. You've chosen to be part of a larger event, for whatever reason. Now, if you are, and that event, I believe, is going to sort of have more resonance for you, the more mixed the audience is in every way, age, race, class, whatever. Because you as a group have got to find yourself, as a group, unconsciously, in relation to what's going on on stage. And theatre, and any performance art, only exists in that space between the stage and the audience. It can't exist without the audience. It can't exist without the actors. It can't exist just on the page, reading a play is something completely different to it being performed. It exists in the interaction between the stage and the audience. If, and forgive me that the bad example I'm going to give is an American one, because I, think I could have easily chosen lots of British ones. I remember seeing a play in Chicago about four or five years ago and you know how sharply divided Chicago is, north and south, racially. And I saw a play in the north of Chicago, it was about, with a large, all black cast, I think, apart from one, it was about racial issues, 
It was about a very, very strong metaphor to do with racial issues, and it was about a, um, it's about black actors in the last century, when, as you know, with the minstrel shows and so on, where, where white actors would black up and do minstrel shows. And it was the case, this play was saying historically, and I believe it was true, that black artists were not acceptable on the stage, but if they look, if they so did their makeup that they looked like white people blacked up, they could be in the show. Now, I can't imagine a stronger metaphor for racism than that. That shaming anything that's so appalling and shaming and all the rest of it. And yet in the audience there were 200 white people 